But we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you, everybody, so much for being here. Good morning. Happy Saturday. May is Mental Health Month, if you didn't know already. And National Mental Health Awareness Week actually kicks off on May 10th through May 19th. So, or May 18th. <laughs> so thank you for being here. Um, celebrating with all of us Wellness Week 2023. It's our second annual Wellness Week. I am Ranger Jess here at J.N. Jane Darling National Wildlife Refuge. And about two years ago, I started as an intern and um, we created this program starting with mindfulness and nature. And um, I was lucky enough to be a part of the self-guided mindfulness trail. And this program has grown and developed into now what is the Jane Darling Nature Wellness Program. So we definitely are really grateful for all of you for being part of this week's event and this bigger initiative. So in addition to U.S. Fish's mission of conservation, conserving land for wildlife, we care just as much about the connection that humans have to nature. Okay, because we are just as important as all the wildlife that runs this planet, um, we make impacts too. So being mindful in nature is good for our planet because we are more connected and it's also really good for our physical, mental well-being. So the Southwest Florida Refuge Complex leader, Kevin Godsey, cannot be here today, but he is thanking everybody for their support and um, sending his best wishes for this week of events. And like I said, our supervisory refuge ranger, Tony Westland, she'll be brought up at the end. She's leading her fighting tour. Um, but thank you to her for supporting us as well. I am going to bring up Christina Shaw, who is a member of the Dean Darling Wildlife Society and employee of the Dean Darling Wildlife Society, as well as an awesome supporter. And she is going to say a few words. Thank you, Jess. As Jess said, I'm Christina Shaw with the Dean Darling Wildlife Society. We are a proud sponsor of Wellness Week, and we also very much appreciate our other sponsors, LCEC and Florida Arts and Culture. We would love for you to sign up for Ding on the Wing if you do not already receive our weekly newsletter during the season, so please do that. And I will turn it back over to Jess to announce our wonderful speaker. Thank you for that, Christina. So before we bring up our speaker, just really quickly, we have a lot more events going on this week. As part of Wellness Week, later this afternoon, right here in the same auditorium, we'll have a special mindful art program creating tree beads or kind of art that you can hang anywhere in your home with our artist in residence, Jackie Roach. You see her artwork featured in the auditorium here. On Sunday at 8 a.m., which is tomorrow morning, we have a slow burning caravan along Wildlife Drive. You can get out there for free on your car, in your car and learn from a brilliant burner and see what's out there. On 7 p.m., we have a virtual mindfulness meditation. On Monday, there will be a workout, nature workout at the Bailey Tract, as well as a mindfulness walk. And on Tuesday, we have our brilliant Robin Kirk, who's in the back here hiding. She is a professional on nature journaling. So come out, get a free nature journal, and learn to do some of that. So you can visit dingdarling.eventbrite.com to learn more about those programs. So with that being said, we are so pleased to announce and introduce our speaker for this morning, Dr. Geraldine Owadis Sese. She is a licensed psychologist and a children's book author, and she has over 15 years of clinical experience. She served as an adjunct associate prof professor of pediatrics at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and the associate director of Institute for the Study of Child Development. She held joint faculty appointments at the Rutgers Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology in the Graduate School of Education. Dr. Wadis Sese serves as an advisor to the WNET 13 PBS Kids and was an advisor and principal investigator for a large-scale resilience study for the Sesame, Sesame Street's workshop, Childhood Resilience Initiative, Little Children, Big Challenges. 
So she specializes in building resilience in children through mindful birding, getting them out there, getting connected, and other creative interventions. With her talk today, Rising After the Storm, Resilience of Birds and People After Hurricane Ian, I introduce to you Dr. Geraldine, or as we like to call her, Dr. Jerry. Thank you everyone for coming today. It's a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, I want to first thank the Ding Darling Wildlife Society for sponsoring um, this event and my talk, and also the staff here at the Ding Darling National Wildlife Refuge. Everyone has been unbelievably so wonderful, so friendly, and I'm so blessed to have met them. All right. So I'm going to do a different framework, and I usually, when I lecture, I like it to be interactive. I want to hear from you and what you want to hear, and we're going to go back and forth. Or also, I have an agenda, too, to share with you. So feel free to ask questions as we go along the way. All right, so I don't know if you've ever heard of the Eastern philosophy of impermanence. Impermanence is the recognition that all things are in constant state of change and nothing lasts forever. It's actually a good thing. So rather than despair or feel depressed about it, it is a source of hope and liberation, especially when we experience very painful, traumatic events. We know that it's you know, not long lasting in this ever-changing world. It helps us develop a deeper appreciation for the present moment, for the people that we are with, and a greater sense of compassion and interconnectedness that we are all as people, connected to each other, connected to nature, connected to the plants and animals, and especially the birds. However, when we go from change, sorry, I forgot my um, other, um, I wanted to focus on these three sayings. The only constant in life is change. Life is a series of natural and spontaneous changes. Don't resist them because it only creates sorrow. Let reality be reality. Let things flow naturally forward in whatever way they like. Letting go gives us the freedom, and the freedom is the only condition of happiness. If in our hearts we still cling to anything, like anger, anxiety, or possessions, we can never achieve that happiness. But change is hard for human beings because there are certain qualities of being human, like fear of the unknown, is very hard. So we worry about them. We're uncomfortable with not knowing. We're uncomfortable with uncertainty. Another is, we're just comfortable in the way we are. Why do we need change? Um, and so that makes you less open to change. And humans are loss aversion. That means you're concerned with the possibility of losing something than having the potential to gain and understanding something new. So this could be embracing change that could result in losses, such as losing a job or a social status. Another is change brings about a lack of control. Um, we don't know what's happening, and, and it's very hard for when we don't have control. Humans love to have control, and we resist change because of it. Another one, sorry. Another one is cognitive bias. It's called confirmation bias, right? We each have our opinions and our beliefs, and we're gonna tend to reject ideas and opinions that are challenging our existing beliefs and opinions. So that's why change is very hard for humans. 
However, during Hurricane Ian, there were a lot of changes. There are physical damages to homes and buildings, loss of property and possessions, especially those that had sentimental value. I understand how that feels because I survived three hurricanes in New Jersey and buying a new house and the first fall was a big flood and it's not only water, but it was sewage. And everything that we had, our kids, teddy bears, our photographs, everything that we've collected, their artwork, was all lost. And it's every five or six years that that happened, right? We could have moved, but we decided to stay. And for each hurricane we survived, things got easier. Because when you're going through these changes, it's a stealing effect. The more that you go through it, through it especially if you're successful. Um, there's risk of injury, of course, loss of lives, unfortunately, disruption of basic service that you need to satisfy birth, um, basic needs like power, water, sanitation, and that all impacts health and well being. And of course, we experience trauma and emotional distress from this experience. But birds also experience a disruption of their migration patterns, which could impact their breeding and survival, the loss of habitat in their nesting, which reduces their population numbers, there's injury or death, and changes to the resources, food resources, um, due to the imbalance of the ecosystem. And land, damage to landscapes, change of soil compositions, which impacts plant growth and productivity, alterations of waterways and wetlands, and introduction of invasive species or pests that can disrupt ecosystems. And as I was driving here in Sanibel, it's interesting, when I first came, all I saw were the downed trees and the devastation. And the more I spent time here, all of a sudden those things disappeared. And what I saw was growth and greenery and beauty and people building. Um, all of a sudden the negative took a back seat and the positive showed itself. And it's due to the people here in Sanibel Island. So people are resilient. So resilience is the ability to adapt, to recover, and bounce back from adversity challenges or traumatic experiences. It's a skill set. It's not like some has it and others don't. So one of the things is adaptability. So as humans, we adapt our behaviors and our responses to changing environments and circumstances. And that helps us navigate challenges and overcome adversity. And we are intelligent and creative. So we are creative solutions uh, problem solvers to complex problems to help us overcome these obstacles. And as humans, we are social animals, so we connect with each other. There are definitely degrees, right, of sociability, and that's okay. Um, we all find our circle, whether it's one or two people, or we find a group. But social support is key when we're experiencing adversity. And one of the things about humans is we have the capacity to have positive emotions. That's gratitude, hope, and optimism. And I'll show you how to do that. And also the ability to self-regulate our thoughts, our feelings, and behaviors. That's what I spend time doing in teaching children, how to regulate their feelings, so that way they are able to reach their higher cortical areas to think and problem solve. But first, we have to deal with the emotions. And it's so easy during this time to forget about it and just go into problem solving mode, which is helpful. However, when you don't deal with your emotions, it's circulating in your head, back and forth, and it needs an outlet. And so that creates anxiety and depression. 
So it's important to talk about it. And anxiety and depression at this time is a normal reaction to what had happened. Birds are resilient too. I did a little bit of research for birds here in Southwest Florida. So for adaptability, pelicans, cormorants alter their breeding patterns in response to hurricanes and other extreme events. The swallow-tailed kite, which I absolutely loved, I got a photo of it yesterday. Um, they have the ability, birds have the ability to migrate. So if their ecosystem is destroyed, they, they move far distances and they adapt that way. The Florida scrub jay will be inactive because of the heat. Um, they'll be inactive during the middle of the day to conserve energy. And wood storks would actually lay multiple clutches in different locations for reproductive success. So birds are very resilient. Now, the basics of building resilience, of course, if who remembers Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? Everyone knows that. And so, of course, the bottom, if you don't have the basics of shelter, clean water, food, medical attention, there's no way you're going to build resilience and improve the ability to cope with what is happening because these basic needs give you a sense of stability and security. And these basic needs, too, is also you know, provided by your friends and your family so that you're not alone. Basic needs also provide empowerment. Taking care of basic needs empowers you to take control during a time when you don't have control. It could provide a sense of agency and help with problem solving and decision making. Very important is the emotional support, which a lot of people often forget. How many people forget about emotional support here and go straight to problem solving? Can you raise your hand? OK, right? It's like, I got to do, do. There's no time to think about feeling anxious or nervous or sad or depressed. But it's very crucial. Validation and understanding, talking to people who could empathize and understand what you're going through is validating and it's comforting. You're not alone in this experience. And with talking with other people, it helps with your coping skills. A trained professional, like a psychologist, a social worker too, could be of help to help you with evidence-based techniques to manage your stress and anxiety. So here's a question for you guys. Raise your hand if you would never consider seeing a psychologist. Wow. OK, this audience is very advanced. <laughs> very advanced. Because in New Jersey, I have three offices in Morristown, Princeton, and Branchburg. And my Morristown um, um, office, I have families, you know, they are in the wealthier socioeconomic status, but they come to me because they want their children to have someone to talk, of, to, talk to. There's not necessarily an issue to talk about. It's like, no, we're, we just want your services. Talk to the kids, whatever is bothering them, you know, talk it out. And if you need us to be better parents, let us know. Give us those <laughs> techniques, right? Where there are other families who would be hesitant about getting mental health because it feels like, you know, it's a reflection on their parenting or, no, my child doesn't need that. We got this. But mental health services helps you with life skills that you're going to need for life, right? Your coping skills, um, your problem solving skills. All of those, your executive function skills, how many kids that you know who have difficulty with organizing and planning. So that's very, very important. And to be aware of self-awareness of right now, your thoughts and your feelings and your behaviors, that's crucial. What you put in your head 
will dictate how you're going to feel and what you're going to do. And I'm going to show you these ants that crawl in your head that prevents you from doing that. Another thing is reconnecting with the community through volunteering. I saw a lot of volunteers here um, at um, the refuge, which is wonderful. Community events such as these, um, social events, just connecting with religious or spiritual leaders, just connecting with people. Oops, sorry. All right, sorry about that. And why is that important? All right, it's because of the validation. You can share resources. Um, you know, what building builders have people been using? What services have they been using? Um, collaborating on projects, collaborating in creative solutions to help rebuild Sanibel Island. And it gives you a sense of purpose contributing to a community's recovering efforts offers a sense of accomplishment and satisfaction and mostly healing. Reconnecting with the community could be a huge part of your healing process through reflecting and sharing your experiences, processing your emotions, working towards rebuilding and recovering together. Okay, I know that Dr. Joe Blanda talked about self-care time, and that's so important. So it's because of the way the brain works. So does anybody know about how the brain, the amygdala versus your higher cortical areas? If you don't calm that primitive brain, which the children know as your emotional brain, or the amygdala, you are gonna be paralyzed. That's why addressing emotions is so crucial. Um, and how to do that is with talking with people. That's the social part. That's why the social aspect of recovery is crucial. But taking time to relax and recharge is important because it puts you in what you call a parasympathetic you know, um, nervous system where it's digest and rest. It's about relaxation. Instead of being an ongoing sympathetic nervous system, which is your fight, flight, freeze response, right, during this difficult time. So relaxing, who finds it difficult <laughs> to relax? I have to raise my hand, okay? And you have to give yourself self-care time, whether it's 30 minutes or an hour, now, there are two types of copers. So there's active copers who love to exercise, bike, surf, jog. That helps de-stress and uh, release the tensions in their muscles, and it helps them free them of anxiety. And then we have the passive copers who love to read a book and get lost in a different time, in a different place, or fantasy. And there are other mindful techniques too, like art, um, flower arranging, jewelry making, and gardening, right? How many gardeners do we have here, right? You could do it for hours. I garden um, every year planting thousands of tulips and daffodils because my favorite garden is my spring garden. And I like to create, you know, a Monet's garden. And that helps me cope, you know, during the winter where it's like dull and everything, um, the trees have no leaves, but to see beautiful flowers, um, it's what I love to do, and travel. But I'm gonna emphasize mindfulness and meditation, especially in nature and in birding, because you get the maximum benefits. Nature is the best medicine. How come you don't hear it so much? Is because it's free. There's no money to be had with going out in nature. So once your amygdala or your emotional brain is relaxed, that opens all the visual, auditory stimuli to go to your higher cortical areas called your thinking brain. 
And that's where you could start to plan um, so that way it reduces future stress and anxiety. So rebuilding more resilient structures maybe for our homes, if you decide to stay or move to a different location um, where you know, um, it's better for you in terms of coping and financially, um, having a communication plan, evacuation plan, emergency, there's your problem solving, right? But oftentimes people go straight to this and not address their anxiety and depression that naturally happens when something like this happens. All right, so here are things to be aware of. How many of you have heard of ants? Automatic negative thoughts, raise your hand. All right, a few of you, good. All right, so this time I'm gonna teach you how I teach my kids. They're called ants, and they come marching in your brain every time you feel anxious, depressed, and angry. And whatever these thoughts are in your brain, you believe them. And because you believe them, it, um, it's linked to how you're gonna feel and what you're gonna do in terms of action. So I'm gonna go through each of them with some examples. Catastrophizing involves imagining the worst case scenario, assuming that it's gonna happen. So here's an example. This hurricane is going to destroy everything and we'll never be able to recover from it. How many catastrophizing thoughts have anyone had? Okay, there's overgeneralization that involves taking a single negative event and applying it to all aspects of your life. For example, if my house was destroyed by this hurricane, nothing ever goes right for me and my life is ruined, right? Maybe you he heard it from your neighbors or your friends. That's overgeneralization. Mind reading involves assuming that you know how others are thinking without any evidence, except unless you ask for them. So an example is, everyone must be blaming me for not evacuating earlier, and now we're stuck here. That's what that sounds like. Emotional reasoning, assuming that your emotions that you're feeling is a reflection of reality when it really isn't. I feel so overwhelmed and anxious right now so that there's no way I'll be able to handle the challenges of rebuilding. I'm just not cut out for this. Another one is black and white thinking and it involves seeing things in absolute terms. Everything is ruined now. There's no point to try to rebuild or start. It's over. It's all hopeless, right? How many people have you heard speak that way? And it's a natural thing that happens when you're going through anxiety. And personalization involves taking the responsibility for events that you have no control over. It's beyond your control. If only I had evacuated earlier, we would have lost, we wouldn't have lost everything. It's my fault and my family is in the situation, right? And that just builds guilt when there shouldn't be and self-blame. So it's very important to recognize these ants because they're not reality. They happen because right? Because you're feeling stressed out and you're feeling anxious. So think of them as when you're reading emails, how many people get spam all the time, right? So in your brain, right, your brain is like a computer. You're going to get spam messages, right? And you're going to treat it like spam email. You look at it like, okay, it's there. You know, acknowledge it, say goodbye to it, and get rid of it. Right? That's another way of thinking. For little kids, it's about balloons, colorful balloons, and there are one or two gray balloons, and it's them choosing right, those colorful balloons. I see the negative balloons. You say, hello, goodbye, and choose the positive thoughts because that's what's going to move you forward. 
So because you got rid of those ants, now you have positive mindset. So now you're gonna focus, in, focus on things you can control, take action to pr improve your situation, celebrate those little victories, and focus on progress. And what are these things? that you could focus on that you have control over, right? Your safety, you know, getting what you need right away, all the resources that you need to accomplish your goals, da um, damage assessment, calling the insurance company, you know, cleaning up and repairs, even if it's little bits, right? A little side of the, your garden, you know, s changes of windows, paints, cleaning up debris, and self-care time. Now that you're thinking positive, it's important to think about self-care every single day, not only Saturday and Sunday or you know during vacation, but you got to build this in. And that's what I tell families. You can't have kids going to school all day long, doing homework all night long without not 30 minute breaks or self-care time. It's important to recharge. Now I'm gonna ask you guys to participate. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna start here. And I want you to go across. These are positive mindset statements. So I want you to speak it out loud with confirmation and strength so others could hear it. Um, with the bullet point, yeah. I'll read it, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes. We made it through the worst of the storm, and now we can focus on rebuilding and recovery. Yes. <laughs> we have a strong community here in Sandbell, and we'll support each other through this difficult time. Okay. Despite the damage and destruction, we can find gratitude in the fact that we're all still alive and have each other. This experience has shown us how resilient and resourceful we can be in the face of adversity. All right. We'll learn from this experience to be much better prepared for future storms and winters. Okay. We can come together as a community to help those who were hit the hardest by the hurricane to make a positive impact. Yes. Our perseverance and determination will see us through the challenges ahead and will emerge stronger and more united. Mm -hmm. We can focus on the positive steps we're taking each day towards recovery and celebrate every small victory along the way. We have the power to choose how we respond to the situation and we can choose to stay positive and hopeful. Through this experience, we'll appreciate the little things of life and not take them for granted. Okay, so this is the mindset that you need. You need to turn that dial into positive. And by you doing this, you're showing your children and your grandchildren how to think about things because life is filled with adversity and changes. That for sure is constant. And sometimes we do have difficulties. Some people have difficulties, you know, moving past, you know, this terrible event and is filled with anxiety. And so finding some mental health support is a great way. Your therapist is your cheerleader. She's a teacher to teach you. I say psychology is about teaching you about yourself and giving you the skills that you need to move forward. So you're learning about it. That's the definition of a psychologist. And for a lot of my parents, that's how they see it. Now, after Hurricane Ian, some, but not all, will experience what you call post-traumatic growth. That's psychological changes that occur within us following a traumatic or challenging life event. 
So that could mean personal strength. Maybe after this event, it's like you're more confident in your problem solving skills. Another one is a renewed appreciation for life. Um, I remember the last hurricane that we went through in 2021 was the night before I was donating my kidney to my husband. So can you imagine, and interesting, we just got our um, basement um, remodeled for the first time after living there for 20 years. And it was devastated and gutted out. And it showed me a renewed appreciation of, you know what, it's my children, it's my husband. And there's a new valuing of what's important in life. And what's, you know, um, so it's reevaluating what your priorities are. Before it was things and now it's people. And, you know, even though those things were sentimental, but we have each other and that's the most important. Also, it could lead to enhanced relationships because trauma develops a greater capacity for empathy, for compassion and understanding of yourself and of each other. And for some people, it opens up new possibilities. So maybe now I'm gonna be a conservationist. That's my new thing. And actually for me, that is. I never thought of myself as an environmental conservationist and now I have a passion for it. It could be helping or assisting with restructuring homes and schools. It could be advocating for improved disaster preparedness and response in your community. And there is also spiritual and as existential growth that you find new, deeper spiritual meaning and reevaluating your beliefs and values. It's important to note that post-traumatic growth is not experienced by everyone because a lot of us has experienced multiple traumas in our lives, whether it's a death of a loved one, um, you know, loss of property, health, cancer. And so those people they've grown to problem solve and learn things. Um, and they don't have this renewed sense because they already gone through it. And if you're feeling like you're not growing and you're not moving and you're stuck, it's so important to reach out to a therapist to help you unstuck. And you'll find a renewed freedom being unstuck. Okay, so one of the things that will help getting unstuck and making you relieve your stress and anxiety is connecting with birds. How many people here love birds? Wonderful, thank goodness, I don't have to convince anyone. I love birding, I bird every Saturday and Sunday and if I can manage during the week, I'll do it. I need it to live, it's, my, it's how I breathe. I take my camera and I take photographs of birds and it's a mindful act and birding is automatic with mindfulness. You're looking and seeing, you're listening, you know, you're looking at movements and when you're trying to take that shot, you take a deep breath and you hold it, right? Just so that camera won't move and you get that excellent photo. If I don't get an excellent photo, it doesn't count. I've never seen the bird, unfortunately. But one of the things is bird songs. Not all bird songs, but certain bird songs, actually research has shown, had to reduce anxiety and stress. And it gives and provides positive emotions, um, such as happiness, a sense of joy and tranquility. It also activates your auditory processing, your memory, your concentration skills, and it keeps your mind sharp. Medical schools are now finding that if they go birding, surgeons and doctors are able to discern illnesses and diseases that are look similar because your attention, like I can never tell between the gulls. I've avoided gulls. Unfortunately, there's 
it's impossible for me to identify them. And some of the shorebirds, like the, you know, the sanderlings, I don't know how many times I have to refer to the book um, to be able to identify it. But if you have that keen sense of attention, memory, and especially auditory sounds, um, birds provide you with that peace and joy and harmony, plus cognitive um, benefits to it. So for me, my favorite bird song is the white-throated sparrow. Does anyone know what that sounds like? Oh, wow. OK. So I've been living in New Jersey for over 20 years. And I keep hearing this early in the morning. And I'm like, where is that bird? What is it? Until finally, I got the Merlin app. And, and I recognized that it's the white-throated sparrow. So this is what it sounds like. It may not sound good to you. That's OK. Um, and also, we all have different auditory sensitivities, right? So it's very important to keep that in mind. That's what makes us different. Nobody hears the same things, right? OK, and this is what it sounds like. All right, birds, our relationship to birds is so important for our wellness. And research showed, this is back uh, research in 2020, that the greater diversity there is in a place, you have greater positive emotions and happiness, right? If you look at the ducks, I know, I mean, I'm guilty of it. I go to the park and I see mallards and I'm like, oh, okay, cool, mallards, right? But when I go to the wildlife refuge, I'm awestruck about the swans, the coots, and the Bonaparte um, gulls that are there, and the spoonbills, and the anhingas. I mean, it just creates that awe and wonder. And that's why it's so important for places like Ding Darling for us to support you know, places like this. And in order to have greater diversity of birds that helps with our wellness, it also means that we need diversity of landscape and habitats. The beautiful places will have the meadows, the forest, the lakes, right? The more diversity in habitats, the greater positive emotions, and research has shown that. But in urban areas, as we know, you know, there are little pockets of these. In smaller scale green spaces, they don't provide the same level of engagement that larger habitats, like the National Wildlife Refuge does, with diverse bird species outside the concrete jungle. Um, in 2018, small green spaces, a research in 2018, found consistent no association with mortality and heart rate, cardiac health. But it did have an association with attention, mood, and physical activity. But they conclude that the best thing to do is preserve our wildlife, our nature. Does anyone recognize this place? Yes. OK. It is Bosco Verticale in Milan, Italy, and it's their attempt to get nature into their lives. But it's still inconclusive of how effective this is to attract birds of different species. Um, so that's an ongoing research. Now, for people who can't be in real world nature, there is what you call virtual reality. How many has tried virtual reality? OK. Uh, my husband had. And he said, oh my gosh, it's so real. <laughs> right? So this is really helpful for those who have limited mobility, um, who need medical care. 
and for pain management and depression in fibromyalgia patients. It's also a great thing to use during dental procedures. A 2014 study has found that. Let's see. For cancer patients in treatment, it reduces stress, anxiety, pain, negative emotions, um, and perceive that the treatment is actually shorter than it is and increases their happiness. Now there are some mental health studies showing that it actually improves obesity issues or body image issues because using VR relaxes and reduces emotional eating. In a 2023 study, it's recent, a 15 minute, three times a week, three week exposure to virtual nature actually helped students with higher levels of nature connectedness, happiness, positive affect, and relaxation. So there are lots of different ways to use this. Yes? Could I, could I comment something about, that just reminded me, um, I was at a mammogram clinic the other day at Lee Health. I was actually at two different ones. And you know how when you go to a uh, doctor's office, there's always that TV on, and it's the Home and Garden Channel, or yes. Property Brothers, <laughs> one of these cooking shows, whatever, and it, it's distracting, and it's, well, I guess maybe it distracts you, but, and for the first time at Lee Health, at these two Lee Health clinics, they did have a couple of little commercials for Lee Health, like, some child who was a patient at the Gola Son of Children's Hospital saying what a good hospital was and all. But most of it was just pictures of nature. Yes. There was flowing water and birds and green. And I thought, you know, everybody that goes to a mammogram clinic has a little bit of anxiety. <laughs> Correct. And, um, so yeah. there to sit there for the, you know, you wait and you change your clothes and you wait again. And, um, to be able to look at scenes of nature, I thought, this is, I don't, all the doctor's offices do this. Exactly, exactly. And that's pretty, you know, advanced for them to do that, right? They know that we need our patients to relax. And that's perfect for a dental office, because I'm afraid oh, of the yeah. dentist. <laughs> so, you know, just seeing nature just calms us. And hearing water flowing, right? Some will have those um, uh, feng shui, like water. Um, things and it's just very relaxing and because it switches your parasympathetic nervous system to relax right just like deep breaths is very very important now who believes deep breaths don't help because I hear it all the time with kids oh, I tried that that doesn't work and I'm like yeah that's because you're doing it wrong right there's a right way of breathing called belly breaths right? Your stomach really has to go out like a balloon because it touches your vagus nerves, which sends signals up to your brain and turns on the parasympathetic system. So if it's not working, it's not that that's not working, but it's more about how you're breathing. And so teaching kids to breathe, um, that takes time. That's excellent. Yeah, so there are different breathing techniques. And you could choose from any one of them, whichever works for you. But breathing is essential. It's there for a reason. And when you're stressed out, there is a reason why you go, <sighs> right? It's your body signaling you need to relax. You need to de-stress. And so it'll do it for you. But to be intentional with your breathing is more effective in reducing that stress.
So how much time do we need in nature? So there's a research in 2019 that actually spending 120 minutes a week in nature was associated with good health and well-being. Anything less than that, no benefits. Anything greater decreases its marginal returns from 200 to 300. It kind of flattens the benefits. So it's not asking much. And you could do it, you could break it up in different, you know, whether it's 15 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day, but just as long as you get 120 minutes total. Now I'm going to talk about this Shinrin Yoku. That's forest bathing. How many of you guys know about forest bathing? Okay. So an aunt eight years ago bought me the book by Dr. Lee in forest bathing. And I was like, oh, nice. Thank you so much. And it sat there on my bookshelf for a long time until I had a certain experience that I'm going to share with you. And the benefits of forest bathing is you're just sitting in the forest. It doesn't matter. You know, it's independent of getting your exercise. And that's because of this phytone, um, phytocytes, phytoncides, sorry. And these are tree aerosols that have anti-cancer um, fighting properties, and they're called NK cells, natural killer cells. So they increase to fight viruses and cancer. They improve your circulation and decrease blood pressure. They also have antibiotic, antifungal, and anti-rheumatic effects as well. And some of the tree aerosols suppress the flow of the hormone cortisol, which is your stress hormones. And so it's reducing your anxiety and boosting your immune system. And this is how we survived dialysis uh, with my husband. Um, he survived kidney cancer, so we went through that. And then 10 years later, it's dialysis and then the transplant. But one thing that kept him healthy was we were birding, we were out in nature. And to me, that made a huge difference in his recovery and mine as well. So Shinrin Yoku reduces high blood pressure, inflammation, reduces the stress hormones, cortisol, triglycerides, depression, anxiety, fatigue, anger, hostility, right? Turning on that parasympathetic nervous system. Um, it reduces cancer, respiratory disease, blood glucose. And again, this is independent of exercise in the forest. And this is research in 2019. Now, I went out to go birding in Lehigh Gorge. Has anybody been there in? Yes? OK, in Pennsylvania. But did you cycle it? Did I what? Cycle it. Oh, no. <laughs> I did not. Actually, we were there because of that little village that's known as Little Switzerland. But I didn't know there was an event going on. And there were like thousands and thousands of people. And in the middle of the pandemic, with my husband being you know, immunocompromised, that was like, no way, right? So we found this place. Um, but this changed my life. And I'm glad that I was able to videotape my experience because that's how much I loved it. And you'll notice something different about this situation. And hopefully it will play. All right, here we go. No, no. There you go. I'm going to make it a little louder. And this was what it looked like, you know, a regular forest with beautiful lakes and changing. But then I heard something else.
Too bad the volume is low. And, yeah, <laughs> it's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, here it is again, sorry. Oh well, <laughs> I don't know if you heard that, but it's Native American flute and drums. That changed my experience. I went from, oh well, I can't find birds here, we'll just walk the forest. And then I heard the drums and the flute. And all of a sudden, I looked around me, these all of a sudden lit up. I was so close to not seeing them but all of a sudden they revealed all of these beautiful mushrooms during the fall and caterpillars and man-made noise <laughs> that interrupted the um, mindful experiment, uh, experience. But music has a way to reduce and oftentimes that's what we tell kids, right? Put together your playlist, your happy list. You could do it too. What helps you calm down? And I was surprised for me, it was Native American flute music and it's healing music. That plus the forest bathing just increased my whole experience in another level. And it stayed with me for months. So before I go to sleep, after hearing problems all day, <laughs> I listen to Native American music. Um, the healing music. Unfortunately, I don't know if you've noticed in the news, right? Have you heard of the ghost forest, right? We're losing our beautiful natural resources because of the encroaching of salt water, which is toxic to deciduous trees, and they rely on fresh water. And going down from Jersey to here, I saw a lot of these things as I was visiting different national wildlife refuges and nature places. And for us, we are interconnected with the forest. For us to be well physically and mentally, we need to save our forest. Without them, we're interdependent for our health for them and plants and other animals and birds rely on nature. So here's a picture. We are all interconnected. When we see lots of birds, that means our, our environment is healthy. And it means that we are healthy. And that's why places like the forest, the refuge, is so important. It's actually helping us live healthier and living a positive life. All right, so that's it. I'm hoping that you've learned a little bit of something today, um, especially those negative, automatic negative thoughts that will happen and I want you to kick it out the door. Every time it comes in, the reason why I showed you and gave you examples is because you need to identify it, identify them. If you identify them, then you know which ones to put in your delete or trash, <laughs> you know. Um, any questions? Yes? What's a good way to start learning how bird, birding? 
what's a good way to start learning how to bird? All right, start with opening the door of your house and your backyard, right? Whether you put out feeders to invite the birds, that's very important. I had a lot of adults do that. Every time I talk to them about birding, they get into it as well. And watch all the birds start coming. They've been there. You just haven't noticed them. Um, and then when you hear them sing, I always say, knowledge is very powerful. So you download the free Merlin ID app so you know who's saying good morning to you, every, you know, or good evening and knowing which birds and how they look like, because it's interesting, once you know how they look like, when you're looking through the trees, you can identify them, because you're, you know, it's like your brain is attuned to looking at them. So always start at your backyard. Um, that's why I wrote a children's book about birding. It's like opening your door, getting out there, and then you know, my character will go to all different national wildlife refuges, but that's the best way. Invite the birds. They're there. They're there. You'll be astounded how many birds you have. Can we hear that sparrow? Oh. Just going to let, remember the sparrow? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so that's the white-throated sparrow, and every time I hear it early in the morning, it just makes me feel happy and emotional for some reason, you know, with the song. I love that bird song. How many of you have your own bird songs that you love? Jessica? I love all, I mean, on the refuge, it's definitely the ospreys. Ospreys? Um, okay. The morning yeah, doves, early, yes. In the morning, and very, like, an alarm, and it's just nostalgic for me. It's very, um, makes me think of waking up in the morning and it's cool day. I gotta go get ready. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Yes. The mockingbird, oh my goodness, the star of my children's book. It could sing hundreds of songs. Excellent. And yeah, and your state bird. That's right. Anybody else have a favorite song? Cardinal. Cardinal. Carolina Wren. Oh, Carolina Wren. That little bird with huge sounds. It's unreal. I'm like, what is that bird? It must be huge, but it's this little tiny thing. All right. Any other questions? Um, yes, you could pre-order it at the nature store. Yeah, it's, it's arriving actually next week, and it'll be shipped here. Yes. Yes. Uh, you showed a slide that talked about nature, spending more than uh, the ideal time is 120 minutes less, wasn't as good, more uh, get up to three hours or four hours. It's, it, it's negative, yet you showed another slide that shows about walking in the forest with all the benefits of it. Mm -hmm. Why would walking in the forest too long be a negative. Oh, okay. So with the short, the 120, yeah. that's like urban, urban walking, urban spaces. And forest bathing, you know, you can walk for two hours if you'd like. And the benefits, I heard, were 30 days a month. So just walking, like, for two hours once a month has such profound benefits. Yes. Thank you for that clarification. Urban spaces versus forest bathing, yes. Other questions? Yes? Yes. Uh, I, I found personally a positive, resilient attitude to be contagious of the people that are positive. Absolutely. Personally, people that have a negative attitude Sometimes they're family members and you can't just get away from them. How, how do you try to manage that? 
Well, <laughs> what you do is, oh my goodness, I have a meeting to go to. You know, so you're kind of like, all right, hi. It was great seeing you, but I got something, I got a place to go, right? You have to do it in a, it's true, with um, misery loves company, right? And it's because that other person can relate to my misery. If um, that person is miserable, I'm not the only one, right? But it's important to create those boundaries. That's another thing that's important. Create your boundaries on what you're going to allow in because it does affect your mind and body. Be there for the person, be respectful, but you should know your level and say, I, I gotta go or I have something else to do to do because you need to stay away from the negativity. So in recovery, people are going to be in multiple, you know, different places. Some will be quick, some will be moderate, some will be slow, and that's okay. That's why we have individual differences and it's important to be compassionate and respectful. And that's why the social support is so important because you're sharing how did I go get over this? How did I go to problem solving mode? Um, how did I survive? And it's important for another person to hear how you did that because they might you know, benefit from that. Yes, boundaries, very crucial. Yes. I, um, I go to nature for the serenity and I really relish that time. And after the hurricane, my body internally was just crying to get out to the beach, to uh, nature, yes. and it was very limited. Yeah. Um, but as time went on, I did go, and it just allowed me to see how much I value those spaces right. as sacred. Right, when it's taken away, right, it's all of a sudden you've learned that, wow, this is how much I need it. But I have to say that as, you know, as I was going around here in Sanibel, I just, I told my husband on my drive here, what's different today? All of a sudden, I'm seeing the rebuilding that I didn't see when I first came in, and the trees growing, and the beauty, and I'm seeing all green, and for some reason, I see less of the brown, you know, of the dead trees, right? And it's having that positive mindset. And also, I think it's the island that exudes this spiritualness of it um, and positivity. Because it's just strange to me. Because I felt sad coming in. And this morning, I'm like, oh my goodness, look at this. Look at what they've done. It's incredible for such a short amount of time the amount of work and the amount of cleanup and new growth, right? And it's going to be, believe it or not, better than it was before, right? And that's why we have to accept change. It's hard at first, we want to maintain the same things, but guess what? All the different things that are being built, it's newer things, it'll be different, it'll be better um, for the community. Any other questions? All right, I hope this was helpful to you and providing you with a positive mindset. Thank you so much.